Chapter Twelve of The Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twelve. George Fillier, Duke of Buckingham. Madame Bonacieux and the Duke entered the Louvre without difficulty. Madame Bonacieux was known to belong to the Queen. The Duke wore the uniform of the musketeers of Monsieur de Treville, who, as we have said, were that evening on guard. Besides, Germain was in the interest of the Queen, and if anything should happen, Madame Bonacieux would be accused of having introduced her lover into the Louvre, that was all. She took the risk upon herself. Her reputation would be lost, it is true, but of what value in the world was the reputation of the little wife of a mercer? Once within the interior of the court, the duke and the young woman followed the wall for the space of about twenty-five steps. This space passed, Madame Bonacieux pushed a little servant's door, open by day but generally closed at night. The door yielded. Both entered and found themselves in darkness but Madame Bonacieux was acquainted with all the turnings and windings of this part of the Louvre, appropriated for the people of the household. She closed the door after her, took the Duke by the hand, and after a few experimental steps, grasped a balustrade, put her foot upon the bottom step, and began to ascend the staircase. The Duke counted two stories. She then turned to the right, followed the course of a long corridor, descended to flight, went a few steps farther, introduced a key into a lock, opened a door, and pushed the duke into an apartment lighted only by a lamp, saying, "'Remain here, my lord duke. Someone will come.' She then went out by the same door, which she locked, so that the duke found himself literally a prisoner. Nevertheless, isolated as he was, we must say that the duke of Buckingham did not experience an instant of fear. One of the salient points of his character was the search for adventures and a love of romance. Brave, rash, and enterprising, this was not the first time he had risked his life in such attempts. He had learned that the pretended message from Anne of Austria, upon the faith of which he had come to Paris, was a snare. But instead of regaining England, he had, abusing the position in which he had been placed, declared to the Queen that he would not depart without seeing her. The Queen had at first positively refused, but at length became afraid that the Duke, if exasperated, would commit some folly. She had already decided upon meeting him, and urging his immediate departure, when, on the very evening of coming to this decision, Madame Bonacieux, who was charged with going to fetch the Duke and conducting him to the Louvre, was abducted. For two days no one knew what had become of her and everything remained in suspense. But once free, and placed in communication with Laporte, matters resumed their course, and she accomplished the perilous enterprise which, but for her arrest, would have been executed three days earlier. Buckingham, left alone, walked toward a mirror. His musketeer's uniform became him marvellously. At thirty-five, which was then his age, he passed, with just title, for the handsomest gentleman and the most elegant cavalier of France or England. The favourite of two kings, immensely rich, all-powerful in a kingdom which he disordered at his fancy, and calmed again at his caprice, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, had lived one of those fabulous existences which survive, in the course of centuries, to astonish posterity. Sure of himself, convinced of his own power, certain that the laws which rule other men could not reach him, he went straight to the object he aimed at, even were this object were so elevated and so dazzling that it would have been madness for any other even to have contemplated it. It was thus he had succeeded in approaching several times the beautiful and proud Anne of Austria, and in making himself loved by dazzling her. George Villiers placed himself before the glass, as we have said, restored the undulations to his beautiful hair, which the weight of his hat had disordered, twisted his moustache, and, his heart swelling with joy, 
happy and proud at being near the moment he had so long sighed for, he smiled upon himself with pride and hope. At this moment a door concealed in the tapestry opened, and a woman appeared. Buckingham saw this apparition in the glass. He uttered a cry. It was the Queen! Anne of Austria was then twenty-six or twenty-seven years of age. That is to say, she was in the full splendour of her beauty. Her carriage was that of a queen or a goddess. Her eyes, which cast the brilliancy of emeralds, were perfectly beautiful, and yet were at the same time full of sweetness and majesty. Her mouth was small and rosy, and although her underlip, like that of all princes of the House of Austria, protruded slightly beyond the other, it was eminently lovely in its smile, but as profoundly disdainful in its contempt. Her skin was admired for its velvety softness. Her hands and arms were of surpassing beauty, all the poets of the time singing them as incomparable. Lastly, her hair, which from being light in her youth, had become chestnut, and which she wore curled very plainly, and with much powder, admirably set off her face, in which the most rigid critic could only have desired a little less rouge, and the most fastidious sculptor a little more fineness in the nose. Buckingham remained for a moment dazzled. Never had Anne of Austria appeared to him so beautiful, amid balls, fetes, or carousels, as she appeared to him at this moment, dressed in a simple robe of white satin, and accompanied by Donna Estefania, the only one of her Spanish women who had not been driven from her by the jealousy of the king or by the persecutions of Richelieu. Anne of Austria took two steps forward. Buckingham threw himself at her feet, and before the queen could prevent him, kissed the hem of her robe. Duke, you already know that it is not I who caused you to be written to. Yes, yes, madame, yes, your majesty, cried the duke. I know that I must have been mad, senseless, to believe that snow would become animated or marble warm, but what then? They who love believe easily in love. Besides, I have lost nothing by this journey, because I see you. Yes, yes, replied Anne, but you know why and how I see you. Because, insensible to all my sufferings, you persist in remaining in a city where, by remaining, you run the risk of your life, and make me run the risk of my honour. I see you to tell you that everything separates us, the depths of the sea, the enmity of kingdoms, the sanctity of vows. It is sacrilege to struggle against so many things, my lord. In short, I see you to tell you that we must never see each other again. Speak on, madam, speak on, queen, said Buckingham. The sweetness of your voice covers the harshness of your words. You talk of sacrilege. Why, the sacrilege is the separation of two hearts formed by God for each other. My lord, cried the queen, you forget that I have never said that I love you. But you have never told me that you did not love me, and truly, to speak such words to me would be, on the part of your majesty, too great an ingratitude. For tell me, where can you find a love like mine, a love which neither time, nor absence, nor despair can extinguish, a love which contents itself with a lost ribbon, a stray look, or a chance word? It is now three years, madame, since I saw you for the first time, and during those three years I have loved you thus. Shall I tell you each ornament of your toilet? Mark, I see you now. You were seated upon cushions in the Spanish fashion. You wore a robe of green satin embroidered with gold and silver. Hanging sleeves knotted upon your beautiful arms, those lovely arms, with large diamonds. You wore a close ruff, a small cap upon your head of the same colour as your robe, and in that cap a heron's feather. Hold, hold, I shut my eyes, and I can see you as you were then. I open them again, and I see what you are now, a hundred times more beautiful. What folly, 
murmured Anne of Austria, who had not the courage to find fault with the Duke for having so well preserved her portrait in his heart. What folly to feed a useless passion with such remembrances! And upon what, then, must I live? I have nothing but memory. It is my happiness, my treasure, my hope. Every time I see you is a fresh diamond, which I enclose in the casket of my heart. This is the fourth which you have let fall, and I have picked up. For in three years, madame, I have only seen you four times. The first, which I have described to you. The second, at the mansion of Madame de Chevreuse. The third, in the gardens of Amiens. Duke, said the Queen, blushing, never speak of that evening. Oh, let us speak of it. On the contrary, let us speak of it. That is the most happy and brilliant evening of my life. You remember what a beautiful night it was? How soft and perfumed was the air! How lovely the blue heavens and star-enameled sky! Ah, then, madame, I was able for one instant to be alone with you. Then you were about to tell me all. The isolation of your life, the griefs of your heart. You leaned upon my arm. Upon this, madame, I felt, in bending my head toward you, your beautiful hair touch my cheek, and every time that it touched me, I trembled from head to foot. Oh, queen, queen, you do not know what felicity from heaven, what joys from paradise, are comprised in a moment like that. Take my wealth, my fortune, my glory, all the days I have to live, for such an instant, for a night like that. For that night, madame, that night you loved me, I will swear it. My lord, yes, it is possible that the influence of the place, the charm of the beautiful evening, the fascination of your look, the thousand circumstances, in short, which sometimes unite to destroy a woman, were grouped around me on that fatal evening. But, my lord, you saw the queen come to the aid of the woman who faltered. At the first word you dared to utter, at the first freedom to which I had to reply, I called for help. Yes, yes, that is true, and any other love but mine would have sunk beneath this ordeal. But my love came out from it more ardent and more eternal. You believed that you would fly from me by returning to Paris. You believed that I would not dare to quit the treasure over which my master had charged me to watch. What to me were all the treasures in the world, or all the kings of the earth? Eight days after, I was back again, madame. That time you had nothing to say to me. I had risked my life and favor to see you but for a second. I did not even touch your hand, and you pardoned me on seeing me so submissive and so repentant. Yes, but calumny seized upon all those follies in which I took no part, as you well know, my lord. The king, excited by the cardinal, made a terrible clamour. Madame de Vernet was driven from me. Putange was exiled. Madame de Chevreuse fell into disgrace. And when you wished to come back as ambassador to France, the king himself, remember, my lord, the king himself opposed it. Yes, and France is about to pay for her king's refusal with a war. I am not allowed to see you, madame, but you shall every day hear of me. What object, think you, have this expedition to Ray and this league with the Protestants of La Rochelle which I am projecting? The pleasure of seeing you. I have no hope of penetrating, sword in hand, to Paris. I know that well. But this war may bring round a peace— this peace will require a negotiator. That negotiator will be me. They will not dare to refuse me then, and I will return to Paris, and will see you again, and will be happy for an instant. Thousands of men, it is true, will have to pay for my happiness with their lives. But what is that to me, provided I see you again? All this is perhaps folly, perhaps insanity, but tell me what woman has a lover more truly in love, 
what queen a servant more ardent my lord my lord you invoke in your defence things which accuse you more strongly all these proofs of love which you would give me are almost crimes because you do not love me madame if you loved me you would view all this otherwise if you loved me oh if you loved me that would be too great happiness and i should run mad ah madame de chevreuse was less cruel than you holland loved her and she responded to his love madame de chevreuse was not queen murmured anne of austria overcome in spite of herself by the expression of so profound a passion you would love me then if you were not queen madame say that you would love me then i can believe that it is the dignity of your rank alone which makes you cruel to me i can believe that had you been madame de chevreuse poor buckingham might have hoped thanks for those sweet words oh my beautiful sovereign a hundred times thanks oh my lord you have ill understood wrongly interpreted i did not mean to say silence silence cried the duke if i am happy in an error do not have the cruelty to lift me from it you have told me yourself madame that i have been drawn into a snare i perhaps may leave my life in it for although it may be strange i have for some time had a presentiment that i should shortly die and the duke smiled with a smile at once sad and charming oh my god cried anne of austria with an accent of terror which proved how much greater an interest she took in the duke than she ventured to tell i do not tell you this madame to terrify you no it is even ridiculous for me to name it to you and believe me i take no heed of such dreams but the words you have just spoken the hope you have almost given me will have richly paid all were it my life oh but i said anne i also duke have had presentiments i also have had dreams i dreamed that i saw you lying bleeding wounded in the left side was it not and with a knife interrupted buckingham yes it was so my lord it was so in the left side and with a knife who can possibly have told you i had had that dream i have imparted it to no one but my god and that in my prayers i ask for no more you love me madame it is enough i love you i yes yes would god send the same dreams to you as to me if you did not love me should we not have the same presentiments if our existences did not touch at the heart you love me my beautiful queen and you will weep for me oh my god my god cried anne of austria this is more than i can bear in the name of heaven duke leave me go i do not know whether i love you or love you not but what i know is that i will not be perjured take pity on me then and go oh if you are struck in france if you die in france if i could imagine that your love for me was the cause of your death i could not console myself i should run mad depart then depart i implore you oh how beautiful you are thus oh how i love you said buckingham go go i implore you and return hereafter come back as ambassador come back as minister come back surrounded with guards who will defend you with servants who will watch over you and then i shall no longer fear for your days and i shall be happy in seeing you oh is this true what you say yes oh then some pledge of your indulgence some object which came from you and may remind me that i have not been dreaming something you have worn and that i may wear in my turn a ring a necklace a chain will you depart will you depart if i give you that you demand yes this very instant yes you will leave france 
you will return to England? I will, I swear to you. Wait, then, wait. Anne of Austria re-entered her apartment and came out again almost immediately, holding a rosewood casket in her hand, with her cipher encrusted with gold. "'Here, my lord, here,' said she. "'Keep this in memory of me.' Buckingham took the casket and fell a second time on his knees. "'You have promised me to go,' said the Queen. "'And I keep my word. Your hand, madame, your hand, and I depart.' Anne of Austria stretched forth her hand, closing her eyes, and leaning with the other upon Estefania, for she felt that her strength was about to fail her. Buckingham pressed his lips passionately to that beautiful hand, and then rising, said, "'Within six months, if I am not dead, I shall have seen you again, madame, even if I have to overturn the world.' And faithful to the promise he had made, he rushed out of the apartment. In the corridor he met Madame Bonacieux, who waited for him, and who, with the same precautions and the same good luck, conducted him out of the Louvre. End of chapter Chapter 13 of The Three Musketeers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 13 Monsieur Bonacieux There was in all this, as may have been observed, one personage concerned, of whom, notwithstanding his precarious position, we have appeared to take but very little notice. This personage was Monsieur Bonacieux, the respectable martyr of the political and amorous intrigues which entangled themselves so nicely together at this gallant and chivalric period. Fortunately, the reader may remember, or may not remember, fortunately, we have promised not to lose sight of him. The officers who arrested him conducted him straight to the Bastille, where he passed trembling before a party of soldiers who were loading their muskets. Thence, introduced into a half-subterranean gallery, he became, on the part of those who had brought him, the object of the grossest insults and the harshest treatment. The officers perceived that they had not to deal with a gentleman, and they treated him like a very peasant. At the end of half an hour or thereabouts, a clerk came to put an end to his tortures, but not to his anxiety, by giving the order to conduct M. Bonacieux to the Chamber of Examination. Ordinarily, prisoners were interrogated in their cells, but they did not do so with M. Bonacieux. Two guards attended the mercer who made him traverse a court and enter a corridor in which were three sentinels, opened a door, and pushed him unceremoniously into a low room, where the only furniture was a table, a chair, and a commissary. The commissary was seated in the chair and was writing at the table. The two guards led the prisoner toward the table, and upon a sign from the commissary drew back so far as to be unable to hear anything. The commissary, who had till this time held his head down over his papers, looked up to see what sort of person he had to do with. This commissary was a man of very repulsive mien, with a pointed nose, with yellow and salient cheekbones, with eyes small but keen and penetrating, and an expression of countenance resembling at once the polecat and the fox. His head, supported by a long and flexible neck, issued from his large black robe, balancing itself with a motion very much like that of the tortoise thrusting his head out of his shell. He began by asking M. Bonacieux his name, age, condition, and abode. The accused replied that his name was Jacques-Michel Bonacieux, that he was fifty-one years old, a retired mercer, and lived at Rue de Fosseilleur, No. 14. The commissary then, instead of continuing to interrogate him, made him a long speech upon the danger there is for an obscure citizen to meddle with public matters. He complicated this exordium 
by an exposition in which he painted the power and the deeds of the cardinal that incomparable minister that conqueror of past ministers that example for ministers to come deeds and power which none could thwart with impunity after this second part of his discourse fixing his hawk's eye upon poor bonacieux he bade him reflect upon the gravity of his situation the reflections of the mercer were already made he cursed the instant when m laporte formed the idea of marrying him to his goddaughter and particularly the moment when that goddaughter had been received as lady of the linen to her majesty at bottom the character of m bonacieux was one of profound selfishness mixed with sordid avarice the whole seasoned with extreme cowardice the love with which his young wife had inspired him was a secondary sentiment and was not strong enough to contend with the primitive feelings we have just enumerated bonacieux indeed reflected on what had just been said to him but monsieur commissary said he calmly believe that i know and appreciate more than anybody the merit of the incomparable eminence by whom we have the honour to be governed indeed asked the commissary with an air of doubt if that is really so how came you in the bastille how i came there or rather why i am there replied bonacieux that is entirely impossible for me to tell you because i don't know myself but to a certainty is not for having knowingly at least disobliged monsieur the cardinal you must nevertheless have committed a crime since you are here and are accused of high treason of high treason cried bonacieux terrified of high treason how is it possible for a poor mercer who detests huguenots and who abhors spaniards to be accused of high treason consider monsieur the thing is absolutely impossible monsieur bonacieux said the commissary looking at the accused as if his little eyes had the faculty of reading to the very depths of hearts you have a wife yes monsieur replied the mercer in a tremble feeling that it was at this point affairs were likely to become perplexing uh, that is to say i had one what you had one what have you done with her then if you have her no longer they have abducted her monsieur they have abducted her ha bonacieux inferred from this ha that the affair grew more and more intricate they have abducted her added the commissary and do you know the man who has committed this deed i think i know him who is he remember that i affirm nothing monsieur the commissary and that i only suspect whom do you suspect come answer freely monsieur bonacieux was in the greatest perplexity possible had he better deny everything or tell everything by denying all it might be suspected that he must know too much to avow by confessing all he might prove his good will he decided then to tell all i suspect said he a tall dark man of lofty carriage who has the air of a great lord he has followed us several times as i think when i have waited for my wife at the wicket of the louvre to escort her home the commissary now appeared to experience a little uneasiness and his name said he oh as to his name i know nothing about it but if i were ever to meet him i should recognize him in an instant i will answer for it were he among a thousand persons the face of the commissary grew still darker you should recognize him among a thousand say you continued he that is to say cried bonacieux who saw he had taken a false step that is to say you have answered that you should recognize him said the commissary that is all very well and enough for to-day before we proceed further some one must be informed that you know the ravisher of your wife 
but i have not told you that i know him cried bonacieux in despair i told you on the contrary take away the prisoner said the commissary to the two guards where must we place him demanded the chief in a dungeon which good lord in the first one handy provided it is safe said the commissary with an indifference which penetrated poor bonacieux with horror alas alas said he to himself misfortune is over my head my wife must have committed some frightful crime they believe me her accomplice and will punish me with her she must have spoken she must have confessed everything a woman is so weak a dungeon the first he comes to that's it a night is soon past and to-morrow to the wheel to the gallows oh my god my god have pity on me without listening the least in the world to the lamentations of monsieur bonacieux lamentations to which besides they must have been pretty well accustomed the two guards took the prisoner each by an arm and led him away while the commissary wrote a letter in haste and dispatched it by an officer in waiting bonacieux could not close his eyes not because his dungeon was so very disagreeable but because his uneasiness was so great he sat all night on his stool starting at the least noise and when the first rays of the sun penetrated into his chamber the dawn itself appeared to him to have taken funereal tints all at once he heard his bolts drawn and made a terrified bound he believed they were come to conduct him to the scaffold so that when he saw merely and simply instead of the executioner he expected only his commissary of the preceding evening attended by his clerk he was ready to embrace them both your affair has become more complicated since yesterday evening my good man and i advise you to tell the whole truth for your repentance alone can remove the anger of the cardinal why i am ready to tell everything cried bonacieux at least all that i know interrogate me i entreat you where is your wife in the first place why did i not tell you she had been stolen from me yes but yesterday at five o'clock in the afternoon thanks to you she escaped my wife escaped cried bonacieux oh unfortunate creature monsieur if she has escaped it is not my fault i swear what business had you then to go into the chamber of monsieur d'artagnan your neighbor with whom you had a long conference during the day ah yes monsieur commissaire yes that is true and i confess that i was in the wrong i did go to monsieur d'artagnan's what was the aim of that visit to beg him to assist me in finding my wife i believed i had a right to endeavor to find her i was deceived as it appears and i ask your pardon and what did monsieur d'artagnan reply monsieur d'artagnan promised me his assistance but i soon found out that he was betraying me you impose upon justice monsieur d'artagnan made a compact with you and in virtue of that compact put to flight the police who had arrested your wife and has placed her beyond reach monsieur d'artagnan has abducted my wife come now what are you telling me fortunately monsieur d'artagnan is in our hands and you shall be confronted with him by my faith i ask no better cried bonacieux i shall not be sorry to see the face of an acquaintance bring in the monsieur d'artagnan said the commissary to the guards the two guards let in athos monsieur d'artagnan said the commissary addressing athos declare all that passed yesterday between you and monsieur but cried bonacieux this is not monsieur d'artagnan whom you show me what not monsieur d'artagnan exclaimed the commissary not the least in the world replied bonacieux what is this gentleman's name asked the commissary i cannot tell you i don't know him 
How? You don't know him? No! Did you never see him? Y yes, I have seen him, but I don't know what he calls himself. Your name, replied the commissary. Athos, replied the musketeer. But that is not a man's name, that is the name of a mountain, cried the poor questioner, who began to lose his head. That is my name, said Athos quietly. But you said that your name was D'Artagnan. Who, I? Yes, you. Somebody said to me, You are Monsieur D'Artagnan? I answered, You think so? My guards exclaimed they were sure of it. I did not wish to contradict them. Besides, I might be deceived. Monsieur, you insult the majesty of justice. Not at all, said Athos calmly. You are Monsieur d'Artagnan? You see, Monsieur, that you say it again. But I tell you, Monsieur Commissary, cried Bonacieux in his turn, there is not the least doubt about the matter. Monsieur d'Artagnan is my tenant, although he does not pay me my rent, and even better on that account ought I to know him. Monsieur d'Artagnan is a young man, scarcely nineteen or twenty, and this gentleman must be thirty at least. Monsieur d'Artagnan is in Monsieur Dessessart's guards, and this gentleman is in the company of Monsieur de Treville's musketeers. Look at his uniform, Monsieur Commissary, look at his uniform. That's true, murmured the commissary. Pardieu, that's true. At this moment the door was opened quickly, and a messenger, introduced by one of the gatekeepers of the Bastille, gave a letter to the commissary. "'Oh, unhappy woman!' cried the commissary. "'How? What do you say? Of whom do you speak? It is not of my wife, I hope?' "'On the contrary, it is of her. Yours is a pretty business.' "'But,' said the agitated mercer, do me the pleasure, monsieur, to tell me how my own proper affair can become worse by anything my wife does while I am in prison. Because that which she does is part of a plan concerted between you, of an infernal plan. I swear to you, monsieur commissary, that you are in the profoundest error, that I know nothing in the world about what my wife had to do that I am entirely a stranger to what she has done, and that if she has committed any follies, I renounce her, I abjure her, I curse her. Bah! said Athos to the commissary. If you have no more need of me, send me somewhere. Your Monsieur Bonacieux is very tiresome. The commissary designated by the same gesture, Athos and Bonacieux, let them be guarded more closely than ever. And yet, said Athos, with his habitual calmness, if it be Monsieur d'Artagnan who is concerned in this matter, I do not perceive how I can take his place. Do as I bade you, cried the commissary, and preserve absolute secrecy. You understand. Athos shrugged his shoulders and followed his guard silently, while Monsieur Bonacieux uttered lamentations enough to break the heart of a tiger. They locked the mercer in the same dungeon where he had passed the night, and left him to himself during the day. Bonacieux wept all day, like a true mercer, not being at all a military man, as he himself informed us. In the evening, about nine o'clock, at the moment he had made up his mind to go to bed, he heard steps in his corridor. These steps drew near to his dungeon, the door was thrown open, and the guards appeared. "'Follow me.' said an officer, who came up behind the guards. "'Follow you!' cried Bonacieux. "'Follow you at this hour! Where, my God?' "'Where we have orders to lead you.' "'But that is not an answer.' "'It is, nevertheless, the only one we can give.' "'Ah, oh, my God, my God!' murmured the poor mercer. "'Now, indeed, I am lost.' And he followed the guards who came for him, mechanically and without resistance. He passed along the same corridor as before, crossed one court, then a second side of a building, 
At length, at the gate of the entrance court, he found a carriage surrounded by four guards on horseback. They made him enter this carriage. The officer placed himself by his side. The door was locked, and they were left in a rolling prison. The carriage was put in motion as slowly as a funeral car. Through the closely fastened windows, the prisoner could perceive the houses in the pavement, that was all. But, true Parisian as he was, Bonacieux could recognize every street by the milestones, the signs, and the lamps. At the moment of arriving at St. Paul, the spot where such as were condemned at the Bastille were executed, he was near fainting and crossed himself twice. He thought the carriage was about to stop there. The carriage, however, passed on. Farther on, a still greater terror seized him on passing by the cemetery of Saint-Jean, where state criminals were buried. One thing, however, reassured him. He remembered that before they were buried their heads were generally cut off, and he felt that his head was still on his shoulders. But when he saw the carriage take the way to La Greve, when he perceived the pointed roof of the Hôtel de Ville, and the carriage passed under the arcade, he believed it was over with him. He wished to confess to the officer, and upon his refusal, uttered such pitiable cries that the officer told him that if he continued to deafen him thus, he should put a gag in his mouth. This measure somewhat reassured Bonacieux. If they meant to execute him at La Greve, it could scarcely be worth while to gag him, as they had nearly reached the place of execution. Indeed, the carriage crossed the fatal spot without stopping. There remained then no other place to fear but the traitor's cross. The carriage was taking the direct road to it. This time there was no longer any doubt. It was at the traitor's cross that lesser criminals were executed. Bonacieux had flattered himself in believing himself worthy of St. Paul or of the Place de Greve. It was at the traitor's cross that his journey and his destiny were about to end. He could not yet see that dreadful cross, but he felt somehow as if it were coming to meet him. When he was within twenty paces of it, he heard a noise of people, and the carriage stopped. This was more than poor Bonacieux could endure, depressed as he was by the successive emotions which he had experienced. He uttered a feeble groan, which might have been taken for the last sigh of a dying man, and fainted. End of chapter. Chapter 14 of The Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Fourteen: The Man of Meung. The crowd was caused not by the expectation of a man to be hanged, but by the contemplation of a man who was hanged. The carriage, which had stopped for a minute, resumed its way, passed through the crowd, threaded the Rue Saint Honoré, turned into the Rue des Bons Enfants, and stopped before a low door. The door opened. Two guards received Bonacieux in their arms from the officer who supported him. They carried him through an alley, up a flight of stairs, and deposited him in an antechamber. All these movements had been effected mechanically. As far as he was concerned, he had walked as one walks in a dream. He had a glimpse of objects as through a fog. His ears had perceived sounds without comprehending them. He might have been executed at that moment without his making a single gesture in his own defence, or uttering a cry to implore mercy. He remained on the bench, with his back leaning against the wall and his hands hanging down, exactly on the spot where the guards placed him. On looking around him, however, as he could perceive no threatening object, as nothing indicated that he ran any real danger, as the bench was comfortably covered with a well-stuffed cushion, as the wall was ornamented with a beautiful Cordova leather, and as large red damask curtains, fastened back by gold clasps, floated before the window, he perceived by degrees that his fear was exaggerated, 
and he began to turn his head to the right and the left, upward and downward. At this movement, which nobody opposed, he resumed a little courage, and ventured to draw up one leg and then the other. At length, with the help of his two hands, he lifted himself from the bench, and found himself on his feet. At this moment an officer with a pleasant face opened a door, continued to exchange some words with a person in the next chamber, and then came up to the prisoner. "'Is your name Bonacieux? said he. "'Yes, monsieur officer,' stammered the mercer, more dead than alive. "'At your service.' "'Come in,' said the officer. And he moved out of the way to let the mercer pass. The latter obeyed without reply, and entered the chamber, where he appeared to be expected. It was a large cabinet, close and stifling, with the walls furnished with arms offensive and defensive, and in which there was already a fire, though it was scarcely the end of the month of September. A square table, covered with books and papers, upon which was unrolled an immense plan of the city of La Rochelle, occupied the centre of the room. Standing before the chimney was a man of middle height, of a haughty, proud mien, with piercing eyes, a large brow, and a thin face, which was made still longer by a royal, or imperial, as it is now called, surmounted by a pair of moustaches. Although this man was scarcely thirty-six or thirty-seven years of age, hair, moustaches, and royal all began to be grey. This man, except a sword, had all the appearance of a soldier, and his buff boots, still slightly covered with dust, indicated that he had been on horseback in the course of the day. This man was Armand Jean du Plessis, Cardinal de Richelieu, not such as he is now represented, broken down like an old man, suffering like a martyr, his body bent, his voice failing, buried in a large armchair as in an anticipated tomb, no longer living but by the strength of his genius, and no longer maintaining the struggle with Europe but by the eternal application of his thoughts, but such as he really was at this period, that is to say, an active and gallant cavalier, already weak of body, but sustained by that moral power which made of him one of the most extraordinary men that ever lived, preparing, after having supported the Duc de Nevers in his Duchy of Mantua, after having taken Nîmes, Castres, and Ouse, to drive the English from the Isle of Ray and les sieges de La Rochelle. At first sight nothing denoted the cardinal, and it was impossible for those who did not know his face to guess in whose presence they were. The poor mercer remained standing at the door, while the eyes of the personage we have just described were fixed upon him, and appeared to wish to penetrate even into the depths of the pass. "'Is this that Bonacieux?' asked he, after a moment of silence. "'Yes, Monseigneur,' replied the officer. "'That's well. Give me those papers, and leave us.' The officer took from the table the papers pointed out, gave them to him who asked for them, bowed to the ground, and retired. Bonacieux recognized in these papers his interrogatories of the Bastille. From time to time the man by the chimney raised his eyes from the writings, and plunged them like poniards into the heart of the poor mercer. At the end of ten minutes of reading and ten seconds of examination, the cardinal was satisfied. "'That head has never conspired,' murmured he. "'But it matters not. We will see.' "'You are accused of high treason,' said the cardinal slowly. "'So I have been told already, Monseigneur,' cried Bonacieux, giving his interrogator the title he had heard the officer give him. "'But I swear to you that I know nothing about it.' The cardinal repressed a smile. "'You have conspired with your wife, with Madame de Chevreuse, and with my lord Duke of Buckingham.' "'Indeed, Monseigneur,' responded the mercer, "'I have heard her pronounce all those names.' "'And on what occasion?' "'She said that the Cardinal de Richelieu had drawn the Duke of Buckingham to Paris to ruin him and to ruin the Queen.' "'She said that?' 
cried the cardinal with violence. Yes, Monseigneur, but I told her she was wrong to talk about such things, and that his eminence was incapable— Hold your tongue! You are stupid, replied the cardinal. That's exactly what my wife said, Monseigneur. Do you know who carried off your wife? No, Monseigneur. You have suspicions, nevertheless. Yes, Monseigneur. But these suspicions appeared to be disagreeable to Monsieur the Commissary, and I no longer have them. Your wife has escaped. Did you know that? No, Monseigneur. I learned it since I have been in prison, and that from the conversation of Monsieur the Commissary, an amiable man. The Cardinal repressed another smile. Then you are ignorant of what has become of your wife since her flight. Absolutely, Monseigneur, but she has most likely returned to the Louvre. At one o'clock this morning she had not returned. My God, what can have become of her, then? We shall know, be assured. Nothing is concealed from the Cardinal. The Cardinal knows everything. In that case, Monseigneur, do you believe the Cardinal will be so kind as to tell me what has become of my wife? Perhaps he may, but you must, in the first place, reveal to the Cardinal all you know of your wife's relations with Madame de Chevreuse. But, Monseigneur, I know nothing about them. I have never seen her. When you went to fetch your wife from the Louvre, did you always return directly home? Scarcely ever. She had business to transact with linen drapers, to whose houses I conducted her. And how many were there of these linen drapers? Two, Monseigneur. And where did they live? One in Rue de Vaugirard, the other Rue de la Harpe. Did you go into these houses with her? Never, Monseigneur. I waited at the door. And what excuse did she give you for entering all alone? She gave me none. She told me to wait, and I waited. You are a very complacent husband, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, said the cardinal. He calls me his dear Monsieur, said the mercer to himself. Pest! Matters are going all right. Should you know those doors again? Yes. Do you know the numbers? Yes. What are they? Number 25 in the Rue de Vaugirard. Seventy-five in the Rue de la Harpe. That's well, said the cardinal. At these words he took up a silver bell and rang it. The officer entered. Go, said he in a subdued voice, and find Rochefort. Tell him to come to me immediately, if he has returned. The Count is here, said the officer, and requests to speak with your eminence instantly. Let him come in, then said the cardinal quickly. The officer sprang out of the apartment with that alacrity which all the servants of the cardinal displayed in obeying him. "'To your eminence,' murmured Bonacieux, rolling his eyes round in astonishment. Five seconds has scarcely elapsed after the disappearance of the officer, when the door opened and a new personage entered. "'It is he!' cried Bonacieux. "'He? What he?' asked the cardinal." the man who abducted my wife the cardinal rang a second time the officer reappeared place this man in the care of his guards again and let him wait till i send for him no monseigneur no it is not he cried bonacieux no i was deceived this is quite another man and does not resemble him at all monsieur is i am sure an honest man "'Take away that fool,' said the cardinal. The officer took Bonacieux by the arm and led him into the antechamber where he found his two guards. The newly introduced personage followed Bonacieux impatiently with his eyes till he had gone out, and the moment the door closed, "'They have seen each other,' said he, approaching the cardinal eagerly. "'Who?' asked his eminence. "'He and she?' "'The queen and the duke?' cried Richelieu. 
Yes. Where? At the Louvre. Are you sure of it? Perfectly sure. Who told you of it? Madame de Lannoy, who is devoted to your eminence, as you know. Why did she not let me know sooner? Whether by chance or mistrust, the queen made Madame de Sergy sleep in her chamber and detained her all day. Well, we are beaten. Now let us try to take our revenge. I will assist you with all my heart, Monseigneur, be assured of that. How did it come about? At half past twelve, the queen was with her women. Where? In her bedchamber. Go on. When someone came and brought her a handkerchief from her laundress. And then? The queen immediately exhibited strong emotion, and despite the rouge with which her face was covered, evidently turned pale. And then? And then? She then arose, and with altered voice, Ladies, said she, wait for me ten minutes, I shall soon return. She then opened the door of her alcove and went out. Why did not Madame de Lannoy come and inform you instantly? Nothing was certain. Besides, Her Majesty had said, Ladies, wait for me, and she did not dare to disobey the Queen. How long did the Queen remain out of the chamber? Three quarters of an hour. None of her women accompanied her? Only Donna Estefania. Did she afterward return? Yes, but only to take a little rosewood casket with her cipher upon it, and went out again immediately. And when she finally returned, did she bring that casket with her? No. Does Madame de Lannoy know what was in that casket? Yes, the diamond studs which His Majesty gave the Queen. And she came back without this casket? Yes. Madame de Lannoy, then, is of opinion that she gave them to Buckingham? She is sure of it. How can she be so? In the course of the day, Madame de Lannoy, in her quality of tirewoman of the Queen, looked for this casket, appeared uneasy at not finding it, and at length asked information of the Queen. And then the Queen? The Queen became exceedingly red and replied that having in the evening broken one of those studs, she had sent it to her goldsmith to be repaired. He must be called upon, and so ascertain if the thing be true or not. I have just been with him. And the goldsmith? The goldsmith has heard nothing of it. Well, well, Rochefort, all is not lost, and perhaps, perhaps everything is for the best. The fact is that I do not doubt your eminence's genius will repair the blunders of his agent, is that it? Well, that is exactly what I was going to say, if your eminence had let me finish my sentence. Meanwhile, do you know where the Duchess de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham are now concealed? No, Monseigneur, my people could tell me nothing on that head. But I know. You, Monseigneur? Yes, or at least I guess. They were, one in the Rue de Vaugirard, number 25, and the other in the Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Does your eminence command that they both be instantly arrested? It will be too late. They will be gone. But still, we can make sure that they are so. Take ten of my guardsmen and search the two houses thoroughly. Instantly, Monseigneur! and Rochefort went hastily out of the apartment. The cardinal, being left alone, reflected for an instant, and then rang the bell a third time. The same officer appeared. "'Bring the prisoner in again,' said the cardinal. Monsieur Bonacieux was introduced afresh, and upon a sign from the cardinal, the officer retired. "'You have deceived me,' said the cardinal sternly. "'I!' cried Bonacieux. I deceive your eminence. Your wife, in going to Rue de Vaugirard and Rue de la Harpe, did not go to find linen drapers. Then why did she go, just God? She went to meet the Duchesse de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham. Yes, cried Bonacieux, recalling all his remembrances of the circumstances. 
Yes, that's it. Your eminence is right. I told my wife several times that it was surprising that linen drapers should live in such houses as those, in houses that had no signs, but she always laughed at me. Ah, Monseigneur, continued Benassir, throwing himself at his eminence's feet, ah, how truly you are the cardinal, the great cardinal, the man of genius whom all the world reveres. The cardinal, however contemptible might be the triumph gained over so vulgar a being as Bonacieux, did not the less enjoy it for an instant. Then, almost immediately, as if a fresh thought had occurred, a smile played upon his lips, and he said, offering his hand to the mercer, "'Rise, my friend, you are a worthy man.' "'The cardinal has touched me with his hand. I have touched the hand of the great man,' cried Bonacieux. The great man has called me his friend. Yes, my friend, yes, said the cardinal, with that paternal tone which he sometimes knew how to assume, but which deceived none who knew him. And as you have been unjustly suspected, well, you must be indemnified. Here, take this purse of a hundred pistoles, and pardon me. I pardon you, Monseigneur said Bonacieux, hesitating to take the purse, fearing, doubtless, that this pretended gift was but a pleasantry. "'But you are able to have me arrested. You are able to have me tortured. You are able to have me hanged. You are the master, and I could not have the least word to say. Pardon you, Monseigneur. You cannot mean that.' "'Ah, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, you are generous in this matter. I see it, and I thank you for it. Thus, then, you will take this bag, and you will go away without being too malcontent. I go away enchanted. Farewell, then, or rather, au revoir. Whenever Monseigneur wishes, I shall be firmly at the orders of his eminence. That will be often, be assured, for I have found your conversation quite charming. Oh, Monseigneur! Au revoir, Monsieur Bonacieux, au revoir. And the cardinal made him a sign with his hand, to which Bonacieux replied by bowing to the ground. He then went out backward, and when he was in the antechamber, the cardinal heard him, in his enthusiasm, crying aloud, Long life to the Monseigneur! Long life to his eminence! Long life to the great cardinal! The cardinal listened with a smile to this vociferous manifestation of the feelings of Monsieur Bonacieux, and then, when Bonacieux's cries were no longer audible, Good, said he, that man would henceforth lay down his life for me. And the cardinal began to examine with the greatest attention the map of La Rochelle, which, as we have said, lay open on the desk tracing with a pencil the line in which the famous dyke was to pass which, eighteen months later, shut up the port of the besieged city. As he was in the deepest of his strategic meditations, the door opened, and Rochefort returned. "'Well,' said the cardinal, eagerly, rising with a promptitude which proved the degree of importance he attached to the commission with which he had charged the count. "'Well,' said the latter, a young woman of about twenty-six or twenty-eight years of age, and a man of from thirty-five to forty, have indeed lodged at the two houses pointed out by your eminence, but the woman left last night, and the man this morning. It was they, cried the cardinal, looking at the clock, and now it is too late to have them pursued. The Duchesse is at Tours, and the Duke at Boulogne. It is in London they must be found." What are your eminence's orders? Not a word of what is past. Let the queen remain in perfect security. Let her be ignorant that we know her secret. Let her believe that we are in search of some conspiracy or other. Send me the keeper of the seals, Seguye. And that man, what has your eminence done with him? What man? asked the cardinal. That Bonacieux. I have done with him all that could be done. I have made him a spy upon his wife. 
the comte de rochefort bowed like a man who acknowledges the superiority of the master as great and retired left alone the cardinal seated himself again and wrote a letter which he secured with his special seal then he rang the officer entered for the fourth time tell vitre to come to me said he and tell him to get ready for a journey an instant after the man he asked for was before him booted and spurred vitre said he you will go with all speed to london you must not stop an instant on the way you will deliver this letter to milady here is an order for two hundred pistoles call upon my treasurer and get the money you shall have as much again if you are back within six days and have executed your commission well the messenger without replying a single word bowed took the letter with the order for the two hundred pistoles and retired here is what the letter contained milady be at the first ball at which the duke of buckingham shall be present he will wear on his doublet twelve diamond studs get as near to him as you can and cut off two as soon as these studs shall be in your possession inform me end of chapter Chapter Fifteen of the Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Fifteen Men of the Robe and Men of the Sword. On the day after these events had taken place, Athos not having reappeared, M. de Treville was informed by D'Artagnan and Porthos of the circumstances. As to Aramis, he had asked for leave of absence for five days, and was gone, it was said, to Rouen, on family business. M. de Treville was the father of his soldiers. The lowest or the least known of them, as soon as he assumed the uniform of the company, was as sure of his aid and support as if he had been his own brother. He repaired then instantly to the office of the lieutenant criminel. The officer who commanded the post of the Red Cross was sent for, and by successive inquiries they learned that Athos was then lodged in Fort Levesque. Athos had passed through all the examinations we have seen Bonacieux undergo. We were present at the scene in which the two captives were confronted with each other, Athos, who had till that time said nothing for fear that D'Artagnan, interrupted in his turn, should not have the time necessary, from this moment declared that his name was Athos and not D'Artagnan. He added that he did not know either Monsieur or Madame Bonacieux, that he had never spoken to the one or the other, that he had come, about ten o'clock in the evening, to pay a visit to his friend Monsieur D'Artagnan, but that till that hour he had been at M. de Treville's, where he had dined. Twenty witnesses, added he, could attest the fact, and he named several distinguished gentlemen, and among them was M. le Duc de la Tremille. The second commissary was as much bewildered as the first had been by the simple and firm declaration of the musketeer, upon whom he was anxious to take the revenge which men of the robe like at all times to gain over men of the sword. But the name of M. de Treville, and that of M. de la Tremille, commanded a little reflection. Athos was then sent to the cardinal, but unfortunately the cardinal was at the Louvre with the king. It was precisely at this moment that M. de Treville, on leaving the residence of the lieutenant criminal and the governor of Fort Levesque, without being able to find Athos, arrived at the palace. As captain of the musketeers, M. de Treville had the right of entry at all times. It is well known how violent the king's prejudices were against the queen, and how carefully these prejudices were kept up by the cardinal, who in affairs of intrigue mistrusted women infinitely more than men. One of the grand causes of this prejudice was the friendship of Anne of Austria for Madame de Chevreuse, these two women gave him more uneasiness than the war with Spain, the quarrel with England, or the embarrassment of the finances. 
In his eyes and to his conviction, Madame de Chevreuse not only served the Queen in her political intrigues, but, what tormented him still more, in her amorous intrigues. At the first word the Cardinal spoke of Madame de Chevreuse, who, though exiled to Tours and believed to be in that city, had come to Paris, remained there five days, and outwitted the police, the King flew into a furious passion. Capricious and unfaithful, the King wished to be called Louis the Just and Louis the Chaste. Posterity will find a difficulty in understanding this character, which history explains only by facts and never by reason. But when the Cardinal added that not only Madame de Chevreuse had been in Paris, but still further, that the Queen had renewed with her one of those mysterious correspondences which at that time was named a cabal, when he affirmed that he, the Cardinal, was about to unravel the most closely twisted thread of this intrigue, that at the moment of arresting, in the very act, with all the proofs about her, the Queen's emissary to the exiled Duchess, a musketeer had dared to interrupt the course of justice violently, by falling sword in hand upon the honest men of the law, charged with investigating impartially the whole affair in order to place it before the eyes of the King, Louis the Thirteenth could not contain himself, and he made a step toward the Queen's apartment with that pale and mute indignation which, when it broke out, led this prince to the commission of the most pitiless cruelty. And yet, in all this, the Cardinal had not yet said a word about the Duke of Buckingham. At this instant M. de Treville entered, cool, polite, and in irreproachable costume. Informed of what had passed by the presence of the Cardinal, and the alteration in the King's countenance, M. de Treville felt himself something like Samson before the Philistines. Louis XIII had already placed his hand on the knob of the door. At the noise of M. de Treville's entrance he turned round. "'You arrive in good time, monsieur,' said the King, who, when his passions were raised to a certain point, could not dissemble. I have learned some fine things concerning your musketeers. And I, said Treville coldly, I have some pretty things to tell your majesty concerning these gownsmen. What? said the king with hauteur. I have the honour to inform your majesty, continued M. de Treville in the same tone, that a party of procureurs, commissaries, and men of the police, very estimable people, but very inveterate, as it appears, against the uniform, have taken upon themselves to arrest in a house, to lead away through the open street, and throw into Fort Levesque, all upon an order which they have refused to show me, one of my, or rather your musketeers, sire, of irreproachable conduct, of an almost illustrious reputation, and whom your majesty knows favourably. Monsieur Athos. Athos, said the king mechanically. Yes, certainly I know that name. Let your majesty remember, said Treville, that Monsieur Athos is the musketeer who, in the annoying duel which you are acquainted with, had the misfortune to wound Monsieur le Cassac so seriously. A propos, monseigneur, continued Treville, addressing the cardinal. Monsieur de Cahusac is quite recovered, is he not? Thank you, said the cardinal, biting his lips with anchor. Athos then went to pay a visit to one of his friends absent at the time, continued Treville, to a young baronet, a cadet in his majesty's guards, the company of Monsieur de Cessar. But scarcely had he arrived at his friends and taken up a book while waiting his return, when a mixed crowd of bailiffs and soldiers came and laid siege to the house, broke open several doors. The cardinal made the king a sign, which signified, that was on account of the affair about which I spoke to you. "'We all know that,' interrupted the king, "'for all that was done for our service.' "'Then,' said Treville, "'it was also for your majesty's service that one of my musketeers, who was innocent, has been seized, that he has been placed between two guards like a malefactor, and that this gallant man, 
who has ten times shut his blood in your majesty's service and is ready to shed it again has been paraded through the midst of an insolent populace bah said the king who began to be shaken was it so managed monsieur de treville said the cardinal with the greatest phlegm does not tell your majesty that this innocent musketeer this gallant man had only an hour before attacked sword in hand four commissaries of inquiry who were delegated by myself to examine into an affair of the highest importance i defy your eminence to prove it cried treville with his gascon freedom and military frankness for one hour before monsieur athos who i will confide it to your majesty is really a man of the highest quality did me the honour after having dined with me to be conversing in the saloon of my hotel with the duc de la tremille and the comte de chaloux who happened to be there the king looked at the cardinal a written examination attests it said the cardinal replying aloud to the mute interrogation of his majesty and the ill-treated people have drawn up the following which i have the honour to present to your majesty and is the written report of the gownsman to be placed in comparison with the word of honour of a swordsman replied treville haughtily come come treville hold your tongue said the king if his eminence entertains any suspicion against one of my musketeers said treville the justice of monsieur the cardinal is so well known that i demand an inquiry in the house in which the judicial inquiry was made continued the impassive cardinal there lodges i believe a young baronet a friend of the musketeer your eminence means monsieur d'artagnan i mean a young man whom you patronize monsieur le treville yes your eminence it is the same do you not suspect this young man of having given bad counsel to athos to a man double his age interrupted treville no monseigneur <laughs> besides d'artagnan passed the evening with me well said the cardinal everybody seems to have passed the evening with you does your eminence doubt my word said treville with a brow flushed with anger no god forbid said the cardinal only at what hour was he with you oh as to that i can speak positively your eminence for as he came in i remarked that it was but half-past nine by the clock although i had believed it to be later at what hour did he leave your hotel at half-past ten an hour after the event well replied the cardinal who could not for an instant suspect the loyalty of treville and who felt that the victory was escaping him well but athos was taken in the house in the rue de fossoyeur is one friend forbidden to visit another or a musketeer of my company to fraternize with the guard of dessessart's company yes when the house where he fraternizes is suspected that house is suspected treville said the king perhaps you did not know it indeed sire i did not the house may be suspected but i deny that it is so in the part of it inhabited by monsieur d'artagnan for i can affirm sire if i can believe what he says that there does not exist a more devoted servant of your majesty or a more profound admirer of monsieur the cardinal was not this d'artagnan who wounded jussac one day in that unfortunate encounter which took place near the convent of carme des chausses asked the king looking at the cardinal who coloured with vexation and the next day burnish you yes sire yes it is the same and your majesty has a good memory come how shall we decide said the king that concerns your majesty more than me said the cardinal i should affirm the culpability and i deny it said treville but his majesty has judges and these judges will decide that is best said the king send the case before the judges 
It is their business to judge, and they shall judge. Only, replied Treville, it is a sad thing that in the unfortunate times in which we live, the purest life, the most incontestable virtue, cannot exempt a man from infamy and persecution. The army, I will answer for it, will be but little pleased at being exposed to rigorous treatment on account of police affairs. The expression was imprudent, but M. de Treville launched it with knowledge of his cause. He was desirous of an explosion, because in that case the mind throws forth fire, and fire enlightens. "'Police affairs!' cried the king, taking up Treville's words. "'Police affairs! And what do you know about them, monsieur? Meddle with your musketeers, and do not annoy me in this way. It appears, according to your account, that if by mischance a musketeer is arrested, France is in danger.' "'What a noise about a musketeer! I would arrest ten of them, ventre bleu, a hundred even, all the company, and I would not allow a whisper.' "'From the moment they are suspected by your majesty,' said Treville, "'the musketeers are guilty. Therefore you see me prepared to surrender my sword, for after having accused my soldiers there can be no doubt that Monsieur the Cardinal will end by accusing me.' It is best to constitute myself at once a prisoner with Athos, who is already arrested, and with D'Artagnan, who most probably will be. "'Gaskin-headed man, will you have done?' said the king. "'Sire,' replied Treville, without lowering his voice in the least, "'either order my musketeer to be restored to me, or let him be tried.' "'He shall be tried,' said the cardinal." "'Well, so much the better, for in that case I shall demand of his majesty permission to plead for him.' The king feared an outbreak. "'If his eminence,' said he, "'did not have personal motives—' The cardinal saw what the king was about to say, and interrupted him. "'Pardon me,' said he. "'But the instant your majesty considers me a prejudiced judge, I withdraw.' "'Come,' said the king. "'Will you swear, by my father, that Athos was at your residence during the event, and that he took no part in it?' "'By your glorious father, and by yourself, whom I love and venerate above all the world, I swear it.' "'Be so kind as to reflect, sire,' said the cardinal. "'If we release the prisoner thus, we shall never know the truth.' "'Athos may always be found,' replied Treville ready to answer, when it shall please the gownsman to interrogate him. He will not desert, Monsieur the Cardinal. Be assured of that. I will answer for him. No, he will not desert, said the king. He can always be found, as Treville says. Besides, added he, lowering his voice and looking with a suppliant air at the Cardinal, let us give them apparent security. That is policy." This policy of Louis the Thirteenth made Richelieu smile. "'Order it as you please, sire. You possess the right of pardon.' "'The right of pardoning only applies to the guilty,' said Treville, who was determined to have the last word. "'And my musketeer is innocent. It is not mercy, then, that you are about to accord, sire. It is justice.' "'And he is in the Fort Levesque,' said the king." "'Yes, sire, in solitary confinement, in a dungeon, like the lowest criminal.' "'The devil!' murmured the king. "'What must be done?' "'Sign an order for his release, and all will be said,' replied the cardinal. "'I believe with your majesty that M. de Treville's guarantee is more than sufficient.' Treville bowed very respectfully, with a joy that was not unmixed with fear. He would have preferred an obstinate resistance on the part of the cardinal to this sudden yielding. The king signed the order for release, and Treville carried it away without delay. As he was about to leave the presence, the cardinal gave him a friendly smile, and said, "'A perfect harmony reigns, sire, between the leaders and the soldiers of your musketeers, which must be profitable for the service and honourable to all.' "'He will play me some dog's trick or other, and that immediately,' said Treville, 
one has never the last word with such a man but let us be quick the king may change his mind in an hour and at all events it is more difficult to replace a man in the fort l'eveque or the bastille who has got out than to keep a prisoner there who is in Monsieur de treville made his entrance triumphantly into the fort l'eveque whence he delivered the musketeer whose peaceful indifference had not for a moment abandoned him the first time he saw d'artagnan you have come off well said he to him there is your jussac thrust paid for there still remains that of Burdenshoe, but you must not be too confident. As to the rest, M. de Treville had good reason to mistrust the cardinal, and to think that all was not over, for scarcely had the captain of the musketeers closed the door after him, than his eminence said to the king, "'Now that we are at length by ourselves, we will, if your majesty pleases, converse seriously. Sire.' buckingham has been in paris five days and only left this morning end of chapter chapter sixteen of the three musketeers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org this recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 16 In which Monsieur Seguier, Keeper of the Seals, looks more than once for the bell. It is impossible to form an idea of the impression these few words made upon Louis the Thirteenth. He grew pale and red alternately, and the cardinal saw at once that he had recovered by a single blow all the ground he had lost. "'Buckingham in Paris!' cried he. "'And why does he come?' "'To conspire, no doubt, with your enemies, the Huguenots and the Spaniards.' "'No, pas dieu, no! To conspire against my honour with Madame de Chevreuse, Madame de Longueville, and the Conde. "'Oh, sire, what an idea! The Queen is too virtuous!' and besides loves your majesty too well woman is weak monsieur cardinal said the king and as to loving me much i have my own opinion as to that love i not the less maintain said the cardinal that the duke of buckingham came to paris for a project wholly political and i am sure that he came for quite another purpose monsieur cardinal but if the queen be guilty, let her tremble. Indeed, said the cardinal, whatever repugnance I may have to directing my mind to such a treason, your majesty compels me to think of it. Madame de Lannoy, whom, according to your majesty's command, I have frequently interrogated, told me this morning that the night before last her majesty sat up very late, that this morning she wept much, and that she was writing all day. "'That's it!' cried the king. "'To him, no doubt. Cardinal, I must have the queen's papers.' "'But how to take them, sire? It seems to me that it is neither your majesty nor myself who can charge himself with such a mission.' "'How did they act with regard to Maréchal d'Ancre? cried the king, in the highest state of choler. First her closets were thoroughly searched, and then she herself. The Maréchal d'Ancre was no more than the Maréchal d'Ancre, a Florentine adventurer, sire, and that was all, while the august spouse of your majesty is Anne of Austria, Queen of France, that is to say, one of the greatest princesses in the world. She is not the less guilty, Monsieur Duke, the more she has forgotten the high position in which she was placed, the more degrading is her fall. Besides, I long ago determined to put an end to all these petty intrigues of policy and love. She has near her a certain Laporte. Who, I believe, is the mainspring of all this, I confess, said the cardinal. You think, then, as I do, that she deceives me, said the king. I believe, and I repeat it to your majesty, that the queen conspires against the power of the king, 
but I have not said against his honour. And I, I tell you, against both. I tell you the Queen does not love me. I tell you she loves another. I tell you she loves that infamous Buckingham. Why did you not have him arrested while in Paris? Arrest the Duke. Arrest the Prime Minister of King Charles I. Think of it, sire. What a scandal! And if the suspicions of your Majesty, which I still continue to doubt, should prove to have any foundation, what a terrible disclosure! What a fearful scandal! But as he exposed himself like a vagabond or a thief, he should have been— Louis the Thirteenth stopped, terrified at what he was about to say, while Richelieu, stretching out his neck, waited uselessly for the word which has died on the lips of the king. He should have been— Nothing, said the king, nothing. But all the time he was in Paris, you, of course, did not lose sight of him? No, sire. Where did he lodge? Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Where is that? By the side of the Luxembourg. And you are certain that the Queen and he did not see each other? I believe the Queen to have too high a sense of her duty, sire. But they have corresponded. It is to him that the Queen has been writing all the day. Monsieur Duke, I must have those letters. Sire, notwithstanding— Monsieur Duke, at whatever price it may be, I will have them. I would, however, beg your Majesty to observe— do you then also join in betraying me, Monsieur Cardinal, by thus always opposing my will? Are you also in accord with Spain and England, with Madame de Chevreuse and the Queen? Sire, replied the Cardinal, sighing, I believed myself secure from such a suspicion. Monsieur Cardinal, you have heard me. I will have those letters. There is but one way. And what is that? That would be to charge Monsieur de Seguier, the keeper of the seals, with this mission. The matter enters completely into the duties of the post. Let him be sent for instantly. He is most likely at my hotel. I requested him to call, and when I came to the Louvre I left orders, if he came, to desire him to wait. Let him be sent for instantly. Your Majesty's orders shall be executed, but— But what? But the Queen will perhaps refuse to obey. My orders? Yes, if she is ignorant that these orders come from the King. Well, that she may have no doubt on that head, I will go and inform her myself. Your Majesty will not forget that I have done everything in my power to prevent a rupture— Yes, Duke, yes. I know you are very indulgent toward the Queen. Too indulgent, perhaps. We shall have occasion, I warn you, at some future period to speak of that. Whenever it shall please your Majesty. But I shall be always happy and proud, sire, to sacrifice myself to the harmony which I desire to see reign between you and the Queen of France. Very well, Cardinal, very well. But meantime, send for Monsieur the Keeper of the Seals. I will go to the Queen. And Louis the Thirteenth, opening the door of communication, passed into the corridor which led from his apartments to those of Anne of Austria. The Queen was in the midst of her women, Madame de Giteau, Madame de Sable, Madame de Montbazon, and Madame de Guimain. In a corner was the Spanish companion, Dona Estefania, who had followed her from Madrid. Madame Guimain was reading aloud, and everybody was listening to her with attention, with the exception of the Queen, who had, on the contrary, desired this reading in order that she might be able, while feigning to listen, to pursue the thread of her own thoughts. These thoughts, gilded as they were by a last reflection of love, were not the less sad. Anne of Austria, deprived of the confidence of her husband, pursued by the hatred of the cardinal, 
who could not pardon her for having repulsed a more tender feeling, having before her eyes the example of the Queen Mother whom that hatred had tormented all her life, though Marie de Medici, if the memoirs of the time are to be believed, had begun by according to the Cardinal that sentiment which Anne of Austria always refused him. Anne of Austria had seen her most devoted servants fall around her, her most intimate confidants, her dearest favourites. Like those unfortunate persons endowed with a fatal gift, she brought misfortune upon everything she touched. Her friendship was a fatal sign which called down persecution. Madame de Chevreuse and Madame de Bernay were exiled, and Laporte did not conceal from his mistress that he expected to be arrested every instant. It was at this moment, when she plunged in the deepest and darkest of these reflections, that the door of the chamber opened, and the king entered. The reader hushed herself instantly. All the ladies rose, and there was a profound silence. As to the king, he made no demonstration of politeness, only stopping before the queen. "'Madame,' said he, "'you are about to receive a visit from the Chancellor, who will communicate certain matters to you with which I have charged him.' The unfortunate queen, who was constantly threatened with divorce, exile, and trial even, turned pale under her rouge, and could not refrain from saying, "'But why this visit, sire? What can the Chancellor have to say to me that your Majesty could not say yourself?' The king turned upon his heel without reply, and almost at the same instant the captain of the guards, Monsieur de Guiton, announced the visit of the Chancellor. When the Chancellor appeared, the king had already gone out by another door. The Chancellor entered, half smiling, half blushing. As we shall probably meet with him again in the course of our history, it may be well for our readers to be made at once acquainted with him. This Chancellor was a pleasant man. He was des roches le masle canon of Notre-Dame, who had formerly been valet of a bishop, who introduced him to his eminence as a perfectly devout man. The cardinal trusted him, and therein found his advantage. There are many stories related of him, and among them this. After a wild youth he had retired into a convent, there to expiate, at least for some time, the follies of adolescence. On entering this holy place, the poor penitent was unable to shut the door so close as to prevent the passions he fled from entering with him. He was incessantly attacked by them, and the superior, to whom he had confided this misfortune, wishing as much as him lay to free him from them, had advised him, in order to conjure away the tempting demon, to have recourse to the bell-rope and ring with all his might. At the denunciating sound, the monks would be rendered aware that temptation was besieging a brother, and all the community would go to prayers. This advice appeared good to the future Chancellor. He conjured the evil spirit with abundance of prayers offered up by the monks. But the devil does not suffer himself to be easily dispossessed from a place in which he has fixed his garrison. In proportion, as they redoubled the exorcisms, he redoubled the temptations, so that day and night the bell was ringing full swing, announcing the extreme desire for mortification which the penitent experienced. The monks had no longer an instant of repose. By day they did nothing but ascend and descend the steps which led to the chapel. At night, in addition to complines and matins, they were further obliged to leap twenty times out of their beds and prostrate themselves on the floor of their cells. It is not known whether it was the devil who gave way, or the monks who grew tired, but within three months the penitent reappeared in the world with the reputation of being the most terrible possessed that ever existed. On leaving the convent he entered into the magistracy, became president on the place of his uncle, embraced the cardinal's party, which did not prove want of sagacity, became chancellor, served his eminence with zeal in his hatred against the queen-mother and his vengeance against Anne of Austria, 
stimulated the judges in the affair of Calais, encouraged the attempts of M. de Lafma, chief gamekeeper of France, then, at length, invested with the entire confidence of the cardinal, a confidence which he had so well earned, he received the singular commission for the execution of which he presented himself in the Queen's apartments. The Queen was still standing when he entered, but scarcely had she perceived him than she reseated herself in her armchair, and made a sign to her women to resume their cushions and stools, and with an air of supreme hauteur said, "'What do you desire, monsieur, and with what object do you present yourself here?' "'To make, madame, in the name of the king, and without prejudice to the respect which I have the honour to owe to your majesty, a close examination into all your papers. How, monsieur, an investigation of my papers, mine, truly, this is an indignity. Be kind enough to pardon me, madame, but in this circumstance I am but the instrument which the king employs. Has not his majesty just left you, and has he not himself asked you to prepare for this visit? Search them, monsieur. I am a criminal, as it appears. Estefania, give up the keys of my drawers and my desks. For form's sake the Chancellor paid a visit to the pieces of furniture named, but he well knew that it was not in a piece of furniture that the Queen would place the important letter she had written that day. When the Chancellor had opened and shut twenty times the drawers of the secretaries, it became necessary, whatever hesitation he might experience, it became necessary, I say, to come to the conclusion of the affair, that is to say, to search the Queen herself. The Chancellor advanced, therefore, toward Anne of Austria, and said with a very perplexed and embarrassed air, "'And now it remains for me to make the principal examination.' "'What is that?' asked the Queen, who did not understand, or rather was not willing to understand." His Majesty is certain that a letter has been written by you during the day. He knows that it has not yet been sent to its address. This letter is not in your table, nor in your secretary, and yet this letter must be somewhere. "'Would you dare to lift your hand to your Queen?' said Anne of Austria, drawing herself up to her full height, and fixing her eyes upon the Chancellor with an expression almost threatening." I am a faithful subject of the king, madame, and all that his majesty commands I shall do. Well, it is true, said Anne of Austria, and the spies of the cardinal have served him faithfully. I have written a letter to-day. That letter is not yet gone. The letter is here. And the queen laid her beautiful hand on her bosom. Then give me that letter, madame said the Chancellor. "'I will give it to none but the King, monsieur,' said Anne. "'If the King had desired that the letter should be given to him, madame, he would have demanded it of you himself. But I repeat to you, I am charged with reclaiming it, and if you do not give it up—' "'Well?' "'He has, then, charged me to take it from you.' "'How? What do you say?' that my orders go far, madame, and that I am authorized to seek for the suspected paper, even on the person of your majesty. What horror! cried the queen. Be kind enough, then, madame, to act more compliantly. The conduct is infamously violent. Do you know that, monsieur? The king commands it, madame. Excuse me. I will not suffer it, no no i would rather die cried the queen in whom the imperious blood of spain and austria began to rise the chancellor made a profound reverence then with the intention quite patent of not drawing back a foot from the accomplishment of the commission with which he was charged and as the attendant of an executioner might have done in the chamber of torture he approached anne of austria from whose eyes at the same instant sprang tears of rage. The Queen was, as we have said, 
of great beauty. The commission might well be called delicate, and the king had reached, in his jealousy of Buckingham, the point of not being jealous of any one else. Without doubt, the Chancellor Seguier looked about at that moment for the rope of the famous bell, but not finding it, he summoned his resolution, and stretched forth his hands toward the place where the Queen had acknowledged the paper was to be found. Anne of Austria took one step backward, became so pale that it might be said she was dying, and leaning with her left hand upon a table behind her to keep herself from falling, she with her right hand drew the paper from her bosom, and held it out to the keeper of the seals. "'There, monsieur, there is that letter,' cried the queen, with a broken and trembling voice. "'Take it, and deliver me from your odious presence!' The Chancellor, who, on his part, trembled with an emotion easily to be conceived, took the letter, bowed to the ground, and retired. The door was scarcely closed upon him, when the queen sank, half fading, into the arms of her women. The Chancellor carried the letter to the king without having read a single word of it. The king took it with a trembling hand, looked for the address, which was wanting, became very pale, opened it slowly, then seeing by the first words that it was addressed to the king of Spain, he read it rapidly. It was nothing but a plan of attack against the cardinal. The queen pressed her brother and the emperor of Austria to appear to be wounded, as they really were, by the policy of Richelieu, the eternal object of which was the abasement of the house of Austria, to declare war against France, and as a condition of peace, to insist upon the dismissal of the cardinal. But as to love, there was not a single word about it in all the letter. The king, quite delighted, inquired if the cardinal was still at the Louvre. He was told that his eminence awaited the order of his majesty in the business cabinet. The king went straight to him. "'There, duke,' said he, "'you were right, and I was wrong.' The whole intrigue is political, and there is not the least question of love in this letter. But, on the other hand, there is abundant question of you. The cardinal took the letter, and read it with the greatest attention. Then, when he had arrived at the end of it, he read it a second time. "'Well, your majesty,' said he, "'you see how far my enemies go. They menace you with two wars if you do not dismiss me.' In your place, in truth, sire, I should yield to such powerful instance, and on my part it would be a real happiness to withdraw from public affairs. What say you, duke? I say, sire, that my health is sinking under these excessive struggles and these never-ending labours. I say that according to all probability I shall not be able to undergo the fatigues of the siege of La Rochelle and that it would be far better that you should appoint there either Monsieur de Conde, Monsieur de Bassopierre, or some valiant gentleman whose business is war, and not me, who am a churchman, and who am constantly turned aside for my real vocation to look after matters for which I have no aptitude. You would be the happier for it at home, sire, and I do not doubt you would be the greater for it abroad. Monsieur Duke, said the king. I understand you. Be satisfied. All who are named in that letter shall be punished as they deserve, even the queen herself. What do you say, sire? God forbid that the queen should suffer the least inconvenience or uneasiness on my account. She has always believed me, sire, to be her enemy. Although your majesty can bear witness that I have always taken her part warmly, even against you. Oh, if she betrayed your majesty on the side of your honour, it would be quite another thing, and I should be the first to say, No grace, sire, no grace for the guilty. Happily, there is nothing of the kind, and your majesty has just acquired a new proof of it. That is true, Monsieur Cardinal, said the king. And you were right, as you always are, but the queen, not the less, deserves all my anger. It is you, sire, who have now incurred hers. 
and even if she were to be seriously offended, I could well understand it. Your Majesty has treated her with a severity. It is thus I who will always treat my enemies and yours, Duke, however high they may be placed, and whatever peril I may incur in acting severely toward them. The Queen is my enemy, but is not yours, sire. On the contrary, she is a devoted, submissive, and irreproachable wife. Allow me, then, sire, to intercede for her with your majesty. Let her humble herself, then, and come to me first. On the contrary, sire, set the example. You have committed the first wrong, since it was you who suspected the queen. What? I make the first advances, said the king. Never! Sire, I entreat you to do so. Besides, in what manner can I make advances first? By doing a thing which you know will be agreeable to her. What is that? Give a ball. You know how much the queen loves dancing. I will answer for it. Her resentment will not hold out against such an attention. Monsieur Cardinal, you know that I do not like worldly pleasures. The queen will only be the more grateful to you, as she knows your antipathy for that amusement. Besides, it will be an opportunity for her to wear those beautiful diamonds which you gave her recently on her birthday, and with which she has since had no occasion to adorn herself. "'We shall see, Monsieur Cardinal, we shall see,' said the king, who, in his joy at finding the queen guilty of a crime which he cared little about, and innocent of a fault of which he had great dread, was ready to make up all differences with her, we shall see but upon my honour you are too indulgent toward her sire said the cardinal leave severity to your ministers clemency is a royal virtue employ it and you will find that you derive advantage therein thereupon the cardinal hearing the clock strike eleven bowed low asking permission of the king to retire and supplicating him to come to a good understanding with the queen. Anne of Austria, who in consequence of the seizure of her letter, expected reproaches, was much astonished the next day to see the king make some attempts at reconciliation with her. Her first movement was repellent. Her womanly pride and her queenly dignity had both been so cruelly offended that she could not come round at the first advance. But— Overpersuaded by the advice of her women, she at last had the appearance of beginning to forget. The king took advantage of this favourable moment to tell her that he had the intention of shortly giving a fete. A fete was so rare a thing for poor Anne of Austria that at this announcement, as the cardinal had predicted, the last trace of her resentment disappeared, if not from her heart, at least from her countenance. She asked upon what day this fete would take place, but the king replied that he must consult the cardinal upon that head. Indeed, every day the king asked the cardinal when this fete should take place, and every day the cardinal, under some pretext, deferred fixing it. Ten days passed away thus. On the eighth day after the scene we have described, the cardinal received a letter from the London stamp which only contained these lines— I have them, but I am unable to leave London for want of money. Send me five hundred pistoles, and four or five days after I have received them, I shall be in Paris. On the same day the cardinal received this letter, the king put his customary question to him. Richelieu counted on his fingers and said to himself, She will arrive, she says, four or five days after having received the money. It will require four or five days for the transmission of the money, four or five days for her to return. That makes ten days. Now, allowing for contrary winds, accidents, and a woman's weakness, there are twelve days. "'Well, Monsieur Duke,' said the king, "'have you made your calculations?' "'Yes, sire. Today is the twentieth of September.' The aldermen of the city give a fete on the 3rd of October. That will fall in wonderfully well. 
you will not appear to have gone out of your way to please the queen. Then the cardinal added, A propos, sire, do not forget to tell her majesty the evening before the fete that you should like to see how her diamond studs become her. End of chapter. <laughs>